Um, thank you, guys. Um, I, I thank Malaprops for um, having me. And um, as I was telling Stephanie earlier, hopefully I, I won't get um, too glitchy. I'm here um, uh, from my classroom, which is actually right across the street from Malaprops. I have one of the best jobs in all the world. I get to teach uh, creative writing and literature to young people. Um, and I'm here in my classroom um, where I, I don't have any better internet than at home, but I have a lot less distraction. So they, they're used to, um, if, if I glitch out for a moment, I think they talk amongst themselves and then I pop back on. So hopefully we'll be fine, but um, I'm, I'm really glad to, um, to be able to, to do this. Um, I always refer to Malaprops as my happy place. Um, or my office. Um, I do a lot of writing there and I'm, I'm missing being able to be on site, but one of these days um, we'll, we'll be back. Um, so I'm, I'm just enjoying being uh, across the street for the moment where I, I see it as I come into work. So that, that's good. And, and I thank you guys for, um, for coming. Um, one of the, you know, if, if there's a silver lining at all to all of this that we're going through, it's, it's certainly that um, that, that we can sign on to the readings from, from anywhere. And, and I see some faces that I know and that I know are not here in Asheville and um, that, that I would not <laughs> be able to, um, to be with tonight if, if it weren't for that. So um, as we choose to see the good in things, that is, is certainly um, one of the benefits. So I'm, I'm glad to see everybody here. Um, so I'm here uh, today with my second novel, um, The Year of Thorns and Honey. Um, my mom said about uh, the title that it had certainly been the year of thorns and she was hoping that the honey was coming any moment. So <laughs> I hope so too. I, I hope that um, the book in itself can be a, a little bit of, of, of honey. I, I definitely do like to write about um, the, the everyday world. My, um, my books tend to focus on uh, family issues and um, a lot of mother-daughter, um, father-daughter, siblings, motherhood, um, uh, career um, as a mother, um, all of those things that, that are very, um, you know, real in, in everyday life. And, and um, my, my favorite thing is, is to write about um, connections that, that we have with, with other people. So it's definitely an interesting time um, to have, uh, you know, those sorts of books coming out where um, it, it's about some of the things that, that we're missing. Uh, so I'm hoping that, you know, there's, uh, there's some escape and, um, you know, some hope in, in that kind of fiction that, that reminds us of, um, you know, our, our regular world and, and our, our regular, um, joys as, as much as our um, our pains. So I think what I'll do is read a, a couple of sections um, and talk a little bit um, about the book as I go. And then um, my favorite part of, of doing a reading and one of the things that I knew that I would miss with a book coming out during pandemic is, is being able to, to talk to um, to the audience, to the folks who come and, and listen. That's always my favorite part is is questions um, and just seeing what interests other people. I, I kind of feel like, you know, as a writer, um, the the part of the process that's for me is, is writing the book, and and now it's out, it's published, and so now it's it's for other people. So um, I'm always interested to to hear, you know, what what other people might might be thinking, um, either about the book if they've read it or or just about the you know the ideas. Um, within it. All right, so enough out of me. Um, I'm going to read uh, the, the very opening pages to start with. Um, the, the Lemonade Year follows uh, Nina, um, who uh, is, I think, a really um, relatable character in that she's sort of the, the, the real version of um, probably most people in so much as um, I feel like she's really honest, not so much with other people, but with herself. And you kind of see that, uh, cause it's told first person. Um, so you see um, 
how she feels about things and what she thinks versus how she presents herself. And um, I think she's, um, well, she's full of flaws. Uh, she's um, uh, prone to make the wrong decision for what she thinks is the right reason. Um, and then to continue to dig a hole when <laughs> she realizes she's done the wrong thing. Um, so I think sometimes uh, following a character like that, if nothing else, will make you feel a little bit better about um, your own um, mistakes that, that keep you up at two o'clock in the morning. Why did I do that? Why did I say that? Um, so here are the, the opening pages, um, the year in Thorns and Honey, January. It's just like me to force roses into bloom, more like me to find my finger pricked while pruning them. A bright red dot of blood blooms on my thumb while outside a gray sky parts the release and unexpected snow. It's 10 a.m. on New Year's Day and already I'm looking for a loophole to get out of my resolutions. Be more positive, drink less coffee. Oh well. I push open the curtains that cover the glass doorway to my balcony so that I can get a good look at the white nuisance falling from the sky. I don't like snow, so sue me, them. Isn't it magical? Doesn't it make you feel like all the world's aglow? Me, no. I check the sliding glass door to make sure that it's locked as if the snow has fingers and might slip them around the handle from the outside and slide the door open with its cold self. Safely on the inside, I turn the terracotta pot that contains my latest project, roses, around so that the sun can find the other side of the bush, only there is no sun. I reach into the plant to pluck a withered petal and am pricked again. I give up. New resolution, drink all the coffee and wallow in negativity. Done. Still, there are blooms on the bush, so that says something. On the way to the coffee pot, I put, I put my thumb to my lip and taste the tang of metal. I shiver having forgotten to turn the heat up last night and the air in the condo is still and cold. My bare feet rebel against the tiled kitchen floor. What's the difference between a resolution and an empty promise anyway? How does the changing of a single second from one year to the next produce significant change? I mean, I'm still wearing my pajamas and I can technically say I haven't combed my hair since last year. Yes, that does it. Pressure off, no need to pretend to become a better version of myself overnight. I slink around silent and careful not to wake the sleeping bear in the other room, my 17-year-old daughter, Cassie. She went out with friends last night and I let her stay out past curfew. I hear her come home just after midnight. This new chapter of teendom is not something I like. More space, more responsibility, more sheer terror. She's growing up and out the door and I'm trying hard not to cling to her shirt tail as she goes. I could swear that even her bedroom is getting closer to the front door. I've counted the steps from one door frame to the other. One of these days, I know I'm going to recount and find that it's a smaller number somehow. Um, so that's um, the first couple of pages of, of the novel, just to get a kind of a taste of, uh, of Nina's voice and um, kind of where she is in, in her world. She is um, uh, living with her, her teenage daughter. Um, she is engaged to her ex-husband, um, which is um, something that she's not so sure is a good idea, um, but uh, uh, loves him um, enough to try it again. Um, so I'm, the next part I'm going to read is a little interchange um, between the, the two of them. Um, the, the character of, of Jack, uh, her husband, um, is, is sometimes her, um, you know, her, her opposite, her, her foil. Um, he, he tends to have a, a lot more patience and, and understanding than, than she does sometimes. But um, I like their, uh, their interaction. I think there's, um, I've always thought that the, the ideas of, of friendship and, um, and, you know, thereby, you know, marriage um, to be really fascinating when you think about people um, and, and who they choose to, to take into their world. I think sometimes with family, we feel like there's an obligation to, um, to, to love that person and, and maybe even to try to like them. Um, not that we always succeed, but um, the, the ideas of those people that, that come into our lives that we have no real obligation to um, 
has always been really interesting to me. The the um, that that way that you incorporate someone else into um, your your heart, and the the way that you give over part of who you are um, to, um, to to let them be uh, who they are. Um, and that's one of the things that's going on a lot in, in this book is um, Nina is um, really kind of struggling with the idea of self and, and who she is. I think that's um, something that, you know, even though you're a grown up, you still, um, you still reinvent yourself all the time. Uh, I was just talking to my students about, um, you know, the, the stories that they're writing and a lot of them are writing, you know, coming of age stories and, um, and their characters are kind of figuring out who they are in the world and what's important to them and, and, and who they are in relation to other people. And, you know, I was saying to them that even as, you know, as adults, we still continue to do that. Um, and so I think Nina is, is trying to figure out um, constantly where she fits in the world. I, I know um, that, that I'm doing that too, especially I think now and during the, the pandemic, the, even though the story has nothing to do with that, I think that's, um, you know, just speaking for me, but I, I'm sure other people feel the same way, is um, you are kind of trying to refigure out what's important and, um, and, and where to put your, your time and your trust. And, um, and it kind of, um, I think sometimes we see that as a failure. You know, if, if we're, we don't have it together, um, you know, I say that to myself all the time. I, I, I got to get it together. I don't really know what I'm doing. And I think that that's kind of the, the constant state of it is, is not knowing what you're doing, but doing, um, you know, all the while. Um, and so I, I think that Nina is um, an interesting character to follow because she sort of represents, I think, all the things that we feel like we're doing wrong. Um, she loves her family with everything that, that she has, but she doesn't always think that she will get that same love in return. And it causes her to, um, to, to stall on decisions or to make the wrong decisions. Um, so I'm gonna read this little passage about um, Nina and, and her ex-husband slash fiance talk about uh, giving a relationship another try. That was probably a, um, a, a big step um, uh, for Nina to, uh, to realize that, that she was the one who had made the most mistakes in their past relationship. Um, I think it's very hard for us to admit when, when we've done the wrong thing and, and placing blame is, um, easier to do, but um, so he, they're, they're back together, and um, uh, this is just kind of a, a fun little scene uh, where we see them interact. Um, they are at a cake tasting. Um, Nina's sister is getting married, and um, since uh, they have uh, kind of waited until the last minute to put everything together, uh, Nina is trying to be helpful because that's what um, the, the firstborn always does is step in and try to, to take care of everything, um, maybe where she <laughs> doesn't need to. But she is at um, the cake tasting with Jack and, um, and he is hoping that um, it will spark her desire to, um, to plan their wedding. He is completely aware that she's hemming and hawing and, and not really wanting to, um, to make a commitment. Um, all right, so he says, uh, they're, 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 they're tasting some butterscotch cake. And he says, let's get this one for our wedding. He says, uh, nodding concession as he pushes the plate toward me, taste it. I remember having done all this the first time Jack and I got married. I remember that hopeful feeling I had, thinking our relationship would be perfect. I wanna have that same hope now. Maybe things will be better this time. We never got to the part of a relationship where you learn to finally love each other despite it all. My mother says that part exists. I hope so. Still, I'm not ready to jump back in yet. It's too soon to order our cake, I say. We haven't picked a date. He looks at me a challenge. You can taste it though, he says. The plate comes my way again. We're here, we might as well start planning. You know, especially if this shop is so busy. He has my number and I know it. 
I taste the butterscotch cake. It's good, I say, as if it's not as delicious as it really is. Good, Jack's eyebrows lift. The baker comes back to the table to check on us. How did you like the first two? She asks expectantly. I thought the butterscotch was great, but apparently it's just good, Jack says, looking at me. I'm evidently not the best judge of cakes, if that's what we're talking about. The baker looks confused. Did you want something other than cake? He's just had too much frosting, I say, and raise my eyebrow back at him. The first two were wonderful. What else do you have? Is that what's keeping you from deciding? Jack asks, a combination of mock and sincere concern. What else might be back there? What, else, what if nothing else is back there? What if this cake that is sitting on this table, he says and points to the cake and then to the table, is the only cake there is and it's perfectly fine and will work for the occasion. Would that be good enough? Or do you really need to see what other cake is out there? The baker looks from Jack to me and back to Jack. So do you want me to bring out other samples? I'm not sure I'm following what's happening. I look Jack in the eye. I like this butterscotch cake just fine. I don't want you to like it just fine. I want you to think it's the best thing you've ever had. The baker tries again. It is our best selling cake. Hear that, Jack says with a sm sly smile donning his face. This butterscotch cake is very desirable. The most desirable, you might say. He lifts one eyebrow again and the corner of his smile twitches. I roll my eyes at him playfully. He's not angry with me, but I know he means what he's saying. So do you want to go with the butterscotch cake? The baker asks, visibly confused. Jack sits there, the sly smile replacing by, replaced by waiting eyes. For just a moment, I'm not looking at my ex-husband. I'm looking at this man I've been dating for a year, who is really handsome and a terrific kisser, who really likes me and is the father of my child. And actually, he did just propose. And I sort of said yes, although I said it in Spanish. And wow, it really does show that he's been working out. Yet, I can't quite get my head in line with my heart. I can't convince myself that this time around will be any easier. So um, we, we kind of see uh, Nina right where she wants to be, but not really able to accept it. Um, one of the things I think about this book that it's, um, um, it's about wanting it all and then realizing that you already had it, um, but maybe realizing that um, too little, too late to not lose it. Um, so um, I, I think that uh, one of the, the things about um, the, the book that, um, that I enjoyed writing uh, was uh, just kind of going along with Nina on that, um, that ride of um, kn knowing what you want, but not being able to, to reach out and, and take it. Um, she, she tends to have things right at her fingertips, um, but uh, second guesses herself um, quite often. Um, the, um, the, the book sort of unofficially uh, takes place in Asheville. Um, uh, I, as did the other one, um, uh, there, there are a couple of places that are kind of named um, outright and of course there there are a couple of scenes that that do take place in in Malaprops although I, I don't um, actually say the name of the store I think if you're from Asheville you would know exactly uh, where I was talking about so I I do have I have, have fun dropping those um, those little things in um, and uh, I'm not really sure uh, but I, I I think that the cake shop in my mind is, is probably um, Karen Donatelli's that was next to <laughs> um, Mal Malaprops it was where I was imagining um, that happening. Um, so um, looking at our time here, I, I wanna read um, a little bit longer of a section uh, that takes place in the middle of the book. You know, for, for all of the humor um, that, that Nina has um, uh, underneath it, she's, um, she, she's really going through some uh, some struggles, and uh, she's definitely a person that uses humor to to try to diffuse those things, to try to not have to deal uh, with something. Um, in 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 the book, her mother is um, her father has passed away prior, and her mother has put the house up for sale, her her childhood home, and she's really clinging to um, uh, the 
not so much the memories that she has, but the memories that she wishes she had. Um, and there's a, a last little section where, um, where someone kind of uh, calls her out on that a little bit in a good way. Um, but I want to read uh, this, this section of the book. It, it talks about Nina's um, brother and sister um, and uh, kind of gives you a, a, a feel for um, some of the things that have happened in, in their past and the things that uh, Nina is having a hard time uh, letting go of. Um, but in, in her kind of uh, trademark, funny sort of way. Um, and this is uh, July in the, in the year. July starts with an unfamiliar car greeting me as I pull into mom's drive. On the passenger seat, I see a black leather binder with the same face and logo as the for sale sign, the real estate agent. I don't knock on mom's front door, I just let myself in. At first the house seems empty and I breathe out an audible sigh of relief. Everything is meticulously clean. Mom's house is always clean, but this is museum clean, as if it isn't my childhood home at all, but a display replica of it. I imagine a wax figure of mom posed in mid motion as she's coming through the kitchen door and a wax version of my brother Ray sitting on the couch with his feet up on the coffee table. I walk cautiously through the living room so as not to knock anything over and disturb the display. I want to look inside dad's office to see if his wax double is sitting at the desk. My hand rests on the doorknob and my pulse quickens. Voices come into range as the intruders come through the kitchen doorway. It's not open concept, the agent is saying, but don't you love the nostalgic feel? It's like being a kid again, being home. I'm appalled. Yes, it is like being a kid again at home, my home. Oh, the agent says when she sees me, hello, thank you for stopping by. But I'm actually in the middle of a showing at the moment. Can I give you my card and speak to you later? This is my house, I say, sounding just like the child in question. The agent tilts her head and the young couple look at each other anxiously. The agent nods her head and then makes a knowing face. Oh, you're one of Cecilia's daughters, she says. I was just showing this terrific couple your mother's beautiful home. You are Nina. I'm sure Nina can attest to the potential of wonderful family memories in this idyllic home, the agent says politely, but with a hint of, now show yourself out and let me make a sale. Yeah, I'm not going anywhere, agent lady. And yes, I can attest to wonderful family memories this home can make. My family memories, thank you very much. I can also attest to a different set of memories, the not so wonderful ones. It's not as idyllic as it looks, I say before I can stop myself. The agent chuckles, but opens her wise eyed like she can bug eye me right out of the house. All older houses have their issues, she says, turning to the couple knowingly. That's why we do house inspections. Anything we find will be addressed before closing. A few little fixable issues are worth a great neighborhood. Oh, now it's on, agent lady. Just remember you asked for it. This is a great neighborhood, the young wife says and takes hold of her husband's hand. Thank you for stopping by, Nina, the agent says. And, hands me her business card, Millie Preston. Tell your mother she's in good hands. Oh, sweet Millie, it's not that easy to get rid of me. She, ha she turns on her heels and leads the couple to the stairs, presumably thinking that I'm headed out the front door. Let's take a look at the bedroom, she says, with a glance back at me. I let them reach the top of the landing, round the little corner, and slide Millie's smiling face into my back pocket and slip up the stairs behind them. I find them at first in mine and Lola's bedroom. The agent is standing just inside the door and the young couple is gazing through the window that looks out across the street to the neighboring yard. This would make a great room for Sarah, Millie says, her voice lofty and springy like a song. I believe it was the girl's room when Cecilia's kids were little. Her daughter is an artist now. This is a lovely creative space, don't you think? Oh, it is, I say loudly and Millie startles a bit. Great light, but the floor sags a bit. I stop in the middle of the room and slide my foot back and forth right here. That can't be good. The husband wrinkles his brow and joins me in the middle of the room where he slides his foot back and forth too. Hmm, he says. It's just the house settling, Millie says in an attempt to recover the upper hand. Sarah would love this room, the wife says and looks back out the window. I love this window seat. In memory, I see Lola sitting there, 10 years old, her leg braces kicking up in the sunshine as, she finds, as it finds its way into the room. The car that hit her shattered her legs below the knees. 
Her legs were covered, but her brain injuries from the way her head thudded across the asphalt lingered. In my mind, she's got her paints beside her on the window seat, the canvas propped up on her lap. They had given her those paints when she came back from the hospital. She sat in the window painting all the time. Memory Lola looks over at me and then back out the window. Mom hadn't changed our room since we were young. The same white furniture set, the two twin beds in the same place in the room. The posters we put up as teenagers to cut down on the princess vibe are gone after mom's cleanup day, but I can still see them. Band posters and pictures of our favorite actors smiling out from the shiny paper. Next door, I think I can hear Ray's music, dark and solemn. My sister spent a lot of time in that window when she came back from the hospital, I say, sinking to a terrible new low, trying to plant bad memories into the minds of these undeserving strangers. She was hit by a car, 4th of July when we were kids. This is a hard time of year. The wife gasps, did it happen in this neighborhood? No, I say, I'm not that awful. The wife puts her hand to her heart and Millie clears her throat. When I look at Millie, daggers shoot out of her eyes, but I dodge them with a devilish smile so that they whiz past me and land in the wall behind my head. That'll be another thing the young, cu young couple will need to fix. It's a very safe neighborhood, I assure you, Millie says sweetly. Um, she, she will, Millie says sweetly, and holds her hand out to beckon the couple away from me. Shall we take a look at the rest of the upstairs while Nina shows herself out? I'm afraid you can't kick me out of my own home, Millie. Preston, nice try. Oh yes, I say, let's take a look at my brother's room. It's right next door. I walk out and around the corner into Ray's room. The husband is hot on my heels. There's a hole in the wall right here, I say, and take the picture down. My brother punched his fist through it when our dad tried to ground him for driving home drunk. The husband runs his fingers around the edge of the fist-sized hole. He looks at me and raises an eyebrow. Millie takes the picture from my hand and hangs it back up over the hole. I'm sure Cecilia just forgot about that, Millie says. Mom doesn't even know about it. I'm the one who hung that picture there so she wouldn't be mad at Ray. Dad had found his liquor stash in the closet and waited for Ray to come home one night to confront him. I watched out the window until I saw Ray's car slide into the drive. I had put headphones on Lola, telling her that I wanted her to hear this new band I had discovered. I told her they sounded like the way she painted. She was just a kid, but already her artist soul was blossoming. Ray had stumbled in and tripped up the stairs toward his room. I wanted to warn him that dad was waiting for him, but at the same time, I wanted Ray to stop drinking. Through the wall that separated our rooms, I heard Ray let out a string of curse words when he opened the door to find dad waiting. I heard dad calmly ask the keys and Ray loudly refuse. Dad asked one more time and then there was a thud so loud and big against our joined wall that it made me jump. After that, there had been some more muffled talking and then the sound of things being shoved around and then the door slammed to the bedroom. Dad had opened our door and peeped in. He saw Lola sitting on the bed, wearing the headphones and looked at me knowingly. Lola had looked up and waved at him as if nothing was happening. He smiled at her in return as if she was bright. Not too long after Dad was downstairs, the pummeling sound came through the wall like someone punching it over and over and then something broke. The next morning while Ray was in the shower, I had sneaked into his bedroom and discovered the hole. I slipped downstairs and found dad's tools and went back to his room. I planned to just move the picture that hung on the wall beside the hole over a bit, but when I got to the room, the picture wasn't there. I hadn't noticed that the first time. It was a picture of the three of us kids as babies. I had always found it endearing that Ray hadn't taken it down, even when he'd gotten old enough not to want a picture like that in his room. I thought that maybe it had fallen when Ray beat on the wall, but I found it over by his nightstand. He must have taken it off the wall so that he wouldn't break it. Or maybe he had taken it down to look at it some other time. I don't know, and I still don't, but it made a lump form in my throat that he had guarded it against his anger. Um, so uh, the Ray and Lola in, in, in the story, um, like I said, with the, the oldest child, you want to, to take care of everything and fix everything. And, and Nina so desperately wants to to right all of the wrongs in, in, in the past and not necessarily even for her, but um, she wants to, to, to fix her sister. Um, she wants to fix um, her, her brother um, and she can't fix any of it. Um, and so um, th today in my class, uh, we were talking about genre and theme and one of the things I had the, the kids do, we, we read an article together and it had uh, the six major themes in literature. 
and and um, I asked them to take a look at the themes and uh, to say what they thought that their story generally was. Um, uh, and so while they were working on that, I thought, well, I'll take a look at it too and see <laughs> see what themes I think are in my stories. And uh, there was one called um, uh, Rite of Passage uh, as a genre. And um, the, the article kind of gave three little um, ingredients to how to know if this is your story. Um, and for Rite of Passage, it was problem, wrong decision, and acceptance. And I thought, yep, that's pretty much <laughs> what I tend to write about. Um, life problem, uh, wrong decision upon wrong decision, um, and then uh, acceptance. Um, and so I, I definitely think uh, Nina is, is in the throes of, of all the wrong decisions. And um, as, as somebody who can um, dig a hole like nobody else, she, she goes through the book sort of making things worse upon worse. Um, and um, and you, you hope she's going to figure it out. Um, the last little section that I will read, and then I'd, I'd love to answer some questions, and this one's very short, is just from a very unlikely friendship that she has. Um, she is friends with a, um, a priest um, and who, who is back in town, and um, he, he often, uh, well, all of the time, um, will not let her get away with um, her Nina-ish. Uh, self. Um, he will very lovingly um, kind of uh, call her out on things and steer her in the right direction. There, there's a lot going on with that particular friendship um, in the book. Like I said, the concept of friendship is, is very interesting to me. And the, the things that we, um, the reasons we make friends, the things that we um, get out of that friendship, um, uh, the, the things that, that friends um, help us with. But um, I'll just read this last little bit because I think this is is really at um, kind of the heart of the book. Um, she goes to see him after um, one of the masses um, and she sits down and waits for him. He says, uh, so I guess, oh, she says, so I guess you want me to tell you why I'm here. If you want to, he says, um, if you know. Mom sold the house, I said. I know I'm being childish about the house. It's not my house, it's her house. It holds a significant part of your childhood, he says. I understand that. Things like that are better held in your heart though. Structures are temporary. The funny thing is, I say, realizing something, it's not like it was a particularly lovely childhood. I mean, it wasn't the worst. I'm not looking for sympathy. I just wonder why it is that I want to hold on so tightly to the pieces that are broken. He smiles and chuckles a bit. Oh good, this is an easy one. He pauses like I might answer my own question, but I don't. So he says, you still hope they can be fixed. If the house sells, it's, it's like tossing those pieces into the trash. You don't get any more chances to make things right. But I want it to be though, I say. I want us to be what we could have been. There's the thing, you're trying to fix a broken base, he says. You said once that you were having trouble forgiving and forgetting, that was your clue. That's where you're putting the pieces back together in the wrong places. You're stuck at forgiveness. I don't get it though, I say. How does being okay with the house selling help me forgive my mother? It doesn't, he says. Well, what about gluing the vase together? The vase is my childhood, right? I say, squinting at him. Do they teach you to speak in metaphor? The vase is your relationship with your mother, he says. He smiles. I'm talking about grace. We won't ever be able to fix the vase. You won't be able to forget that it was broken. You might not ever be able to put flowers in it because it might leak water, but you can still appreciate it, value it, treasure it for what it's worth without regard for what you wanted it to be, or even what it once was. You could make it into something new. I could put pencils in it, I say and tilt my head considering the idea. That's a start, he says. I hate when you do that thing when you're wise, I say glancing at him and then out toward the now empty church. No, you don't, he says, not really. He takes the songbook from where I have it open on my lap. He flips through it and finds amazing grace. Grace, I ask, that's the other side of forgiveness. That's a good way to think of it, he says. That's what your mother is asking for. How do you know she's asking? We're all asking each other for grace. I have to tell you though, it can be harder than forgiveness. My slow shoulders slump. I can't win for losing. He laughs in the empty sanctuary, sucks up the sound and swishes it out and sings it back to me. I didn't say any of this was easy. Why is grace harder? I ask. Forgiveness is a state of mind. Grace involves action. He looks away for a second and then looks back. Actions we take, and sometimes actions we want to, but don't. 
I hit, I sit back hard in the pew. These things aren't that comfortable to sit in, you know. They're not supposed to be, he says. Um, so that is um, uh, a, a little bit of a taste throughout Nina's year. Um, and of course, along the way, like I said, she's got life problem, wrong decision, wrong decision, Nina humor, Nina humor, more wrong decision, um, and until she gets to a point of, of whether or not she'll be able to um, yeah, accept things and, and move on. Um, so um, there's tons of other things in the novel that I'd, I'd love to, to talk about and, and share, but um, hopefully you will um, get a chance to read it um, for yourself. Um, but I'd, I'd love to hear um, questions and, and just to see what's on uh, people's minds. And, and I thank you for listening to me read. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Amy, thank you so much for, for sharing a little bit of your new book with us. Um, there's some great, um, there's some great turns of phrase in there. Um, I, I appreciate um, that you get to kind of instantly know who Nina is, um, you know, from, from the opening with, with, in just a few words, you really, you paint a picture, um, you know, new resolution, drink all the coffee it says a lot about, <laughs> about someone, right? Um, so, um, and we do have a couple of audience questions. I wanted to uh, get one in first though. Um, I know a little bit about your process because I've, I've seen you in Malaprops writing uh, a lot in the Malaprops uh, cafe. cafe. Um, but I'm curious about, since this is your second novel, uh, second published novel. Um, I'm curious about what might be the difference in process between the first and and, and second, if there if there is one. What, what your you know, or even if it's not the process, maybe your experience of it. Oh sure. Um, with I, one of the the biggest things is just um, uh, having to do everything faster. Um, with uh, with the first novel. Um, uh, the Lemonade Year was the first novel I had published. It was not the first novel I had completed. Um, but one of the questions I used to get all the time about that book was how long did it take you to write it? And I had absolutely no answer because I wrote on it for years here and there. Um, with the, the Year of Thorn and Honey, um, uh, my agent and I started talking about this book um, when uh, the Lemonade Year came out. Um, so I started writing it um, in 2018 um, and finished a, a good solid draft of it pretty quickly um, because we were we were wanting to you know to to sh to shop it around and 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 get it published. So a lot of the process is just having to do things um, quickly <laughs> after having the first book out. Um, um, otherwise, um, I think my process is is kind of the same. I, I did spend a lot of time um, writing in Malaprops. Um, I've got a uh, four kids at home who, as far as four kids go, are lovely and wonderful, and I have no complaints. You know, their, their um, you know, noisiness and, and things are, are very standard, um, but it does make it hard to, to get things done at home. Um, so I, I do find myself writing in uh, Malaprops a lot, um, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, uh, other coffee shops if it's later in the evening, um, I get a lot done late um, after everybody is asleep, um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I feel like I, I just have to be ready to, to, to roll at, at any time. Um, I get asked the question a lot, how, how do you get so much writing done with, uh, with so many kids at home? And I just have to, I, I write and I'm interrupted every 30 seconds or so and then have to <laughs> go right back to it. Um, I kind of gave up on that idea of the, you know, the, the long hours of writing in the peaceful office and I just have to write in the, the chaos, which people will ask me the same thing about Malaprops. How do you go and write? It's, it's so busy in there and it's, it's so noisy. And I'm like, yeah, but none of those people want anything from me. Nobody is coming to ask me for juice. Nobody wants me to make them lunch so they can be as, as noisy and as crowded as they want. And, and it didn't bother me at all. I have to say, I have wondered that too, um, because we get a lot of people writing in Malaprops and I'm always like, 
how do you concentrate on <laughs> writing in here? Um, but I, but that's an excellent point. Yeah, like there, there are people that you can, you know, what's going on there can be more easily ignored, maybe yeah. than what you have. Yeah. Going on. Um, so, so while we're on process, um, Patricia um, asks, um, or as you are preparing to write a novel, do you prepare an outline or just let it flow? Oh, that's a good question because I used to. There's the there's the um the the difference between plotters and pantsers that you hear um, people talk about in the writing world. I used to be a completely a pantser. I just started writing and whatever came out came out. Um, and then again, once I sold that first book, um, uh, and, and I finished a couple of things in between that one and you know um uh, the year of thorns and honey even. Um, but because it has to be done faster, I, I, I have become a, a plotter. Um, I feel like my sort of letting it all come to me, which I really love that part, happens in my thinking process rather than in um, the writing. So I, I tend to go on a lot of long walks. Um, uh, if I have somewhere that's a long drive, I, I enjoy doing that. Um, because I can think. Uh, so I, I think out all of the things that I might normally have, have typed out. And then I do, um, I do a lot of plotting. Um, I'm at the thinking stage right now of a new book, and I, which I'm so excited about because from the time the pandemic started in, in March, and I hear so many writers talk about this, that the creativity just shut down. And um, so many people I know, and, and me for sure, um, have just been on dry spell as far as being able to create something new. Um, and so I, I started to sort of hear the voices in my head um, not too long ago when I was um, you know, out on a walk. And um, I may, this is, <laughs> probably sounds like over the top, but I actually cried um, when, when I got that new idea because I had not thought of a new story. I hadn't heard a new character speak in seven months. And um, when, when I heard it, it was, it was so you know, visual to me. I saw these two characters and um, talking to each other. And as you can tell from you know, the one I just read, I, I love to write dialogue. Um, and so I heard them speaking and this whole full-blown conversation and in them speaking, I also was getting these, you know, firings of everything that they were talking about and why they were having that conversation and who they were to each other and, and what their history was and, and what they were hoping for the future like, like that. It, it just came back. And so I'm kind of, I had another writer, I, I mentioned that on, on Facebook and, and another writer friend said, uh, don't you love that part? It's like falling in love. And I was like, it, it so is because now every moment that I can, I'm thinking about these characters, just like you would, you know, if you had, had just fallen in love. So yeah, my, my process right now is, is thinking about those characters, daydreaming, and my next step will be to, to plot it all out and, and, then, um, and then write it. That's, that's great to hear. And what a, what a great analogy about, um, you know, you're, you're, so you're in, you're in the, those wonderful first blush stages of romance with your yeah. new, uh, yeah. with your new yeah, book. I love the way she said that. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. really cool. Yeah. You actually just answered Gail's question. Um, Gail, had, Gail had said, hi, Amy, are you working on a new project now that this book has finished it out? And there you go. Um, yes, yes. Excited, <laughs> yes. Um, you, you also actually, uh, I think already partially answered, um, Gary's question, which was how the pandemic changed your writing process. And, and Gary was particularly interested in how you adjusted distractions, um, mm -hmm. since you, um, and you, you, I think you touched on that, but if you have anything, uh, to add, um, or any yeah. advice maybe for writers, you know, dealing with, yeah. you know, um, yeah, uh, one of the classes that I teach um, is, um, I, I call it writing for publication, and it's a little, uh, it's a group of students that, um, uh, that, that are very passionate about writing, and, and uh, one of the things I love about my job is, is, um, is seeing those, um, those talents emerging and, 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 and wanting to encourage, you know, at that point where I remember being that age and, and falling in love with writing, but, the, but those kids too, um, the pandemic has affected um, them. You know, we're not going out, not doing things. We're not the things that would normally, you know, spark our ideas um, are, are just not happening as much. 
Um, so uh, my, my process just got completely shut down um, and I focused my attention on, on other things, um, you know, just in life. Um, and I began to wonder how I was going to even fit writing back into it, um, you know, be, because of, you know, the kind of distraction of, of everything. But um, what I tell, um, you know, my kids and I were talking about today, my writing kids, um, was, um, and I wish I still, I can see it over here. Um, I made this checklist for them, uh, because we had, we had our goals and, and every week we were going to either write a certain amount of words or, or one of the kids was going to, you know, finish a story or, and we had kind of gotten to over the week where the goals were something like, uh, write something. Um, and then the next person's goal was like 10 words. If I could just write 10 words and, um, and I could see that they were sort of like, you know, in this slump of here, I'm in this class because I want to be a writer and, and I'm not writing. And, um, and so another um, thing that had been told to me, I don't take credit for, you know, for the, for the falling in love or this was this, um, I heard someone say um, that instead of thinking about making a living as a writer, to think about making a life around writing. Um, and that, that really changed a lot of, of my perspective, especially during the pandemic, when I think everybody's kind of feeling the crunch of, um, you know, their, their um, pocketbook as well, um, to, to really focus on um, the life that you're creating as a writer. So I have this little checklist over here, and it says, um, you know, just things to do to, to keep yourself in the writing um, life, even if actually writing is, is a struggle. I, I've got read fiction, um, write, uh, read um, uh, an industry article, um, listen to an author event, um, take a walk and daydream, um, submit a piece of fiction you might already have to, to somewhere, um, uh, voice something that you're happy about every single day, um, make a goal and keep it, however small, and then um, research journals and, and uh, publishing houses and editors just to kind of stay in the world. So I guess my um, long-winded advice, my kids also know that I ramble a lot, is to, if the writing part of it has, um, is suffering, to, to not let the rest of the writer life fall away, to still be involved in the other things that are going on to keep that, the fire lit. Well, and, I, and that's excellent advice. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's interesting because we hear a lot of advice from writers as we do these events. And oftentimes there's a lot of overlap and, and oftentimes it comes back to, to things that are very simple. Um, one of the pieces of advice we hear often is just to read. Right, just read a lot, right? People sort of take for granted that you need to, right? That you need to, you yeah. need to read. And, and then like, even if you aren't, you know, I, I love the idea of even if you aren't actively writing or writing a lot, being engaged with that, with, with the sort of the writerly life um, yeah. can, can keep feeding that art for you. So that's really great. Um, so um, I wanna go back to a question from Valerie that's specific to the book. Um, why did you create Oliver as a priest? Is it to address the brokenness of Nina and her family to help yeah. them heal? Um, yeah, the, the character of Oliver, and I know that Valerie has, has, has read the book, I, and, and he is a character, um, th this particular book is a standalone follow-up to The Lemonade. You don't have to have read that one um, to read this one, but um, Oliver is a character that is, uh, carries over from the first book, um, and I, I like when, when I first was deciding to, um, to, to make him be a priest, this is interesting how the character develops, I didn't even realize that that's that he was going to be um, a priest as I was writing him. He he as a character had these these um, as far as their friendship and their relationship went. Um, he always seemed very standoffish and had the secret of his own and um, and it took me a long time to get him to tell me what it was and it was that um, he had left uh, seminary and wanted to go back and. So the, the reason that he is, that I think that he comes back in, in this story, because um, he certainly didn't have to, he could have gone and, and, and worked as a priest anywhere, but um, I do see him as sort of the, um, the uh, I guess the, um, 
the, the spiritual, but, um, you know, the, 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 also the tangible, you know, right here, um, person that, that Nina goes to, to kind of sort out, you know, her feelings. And they've got a very interesting friendship that has a whole, you know, dynamic that I didn't even get into with the reading, um, uh, that I think is interesting in the book, but he's definitely a character. I think that, um, uh, that, that, serves a purpose, um, you know, of, uh, you know, that voice of, of reason, of support, of, um, of um, you know, maybe that, you know, that kind of grace of, um, you know, helping her to, to, to um, I guess, come to that acceptance, you know, back to that rite of passage, the, you know, the wrong decision, wrong decision, and then, um, you know, the acceptance. So he definitely does, I think, play that role. Uh, so we have another another question about uh, the book. I think this will be our last one. Um, and I'll go ahead and point out that we, we spoke earlier about books that you recommend and Patricia has gone ahead and put those in the, in the okay. chat. And if we have any time after, after this question, we can um, discuss those as well. But folks, um, check out the chat too for a couple of recommendations uh, from Amy. Um, so Sherry uh, says, hi, Amy, your novel sounds wonderful, funny, yet also heartfelt. It sounds like this book is about refound love as well as forgiveness, both with the Jack and Nina relationship, uh, both with Jack and Nina and Nina's relationship with her mother. Um, so she's asking, is that is that right? And does this relate to your own life? Ooh, um, yeah, I think that's definitely uh, right. It's definitely about um, you know refound love and um, and the difference I think between the expectations that we have of relationships versus the reality of them and, um, and, and, and being able to not let the expectations sort of like the vase part that I read, um, being able to, to, to love and appreciate the relationship of what it is versus what you thought that it would be. I think a lot of times we, we have, relationships romanticized, um, sometimes by books, sometimes by movies. I always say, um, you know, to, to folks that there's a reason why the romantic comedy ends when it does, when, when the characters have just fallen in love and gotten together, because the rest of it, uh, if they stay together, is sometimes pretty rocky. Um, and I, and I think it's kind of a disservice that maybe we don't see more of the, the rocky uh, parts of it. Um, and the, the way that those also smooth out and, and we learn how to be um, our real selves in a relationship and how to, how to love somebody else's real self as well. Um, and I think that even though, um, I, you know, I have, I have not, you know, divorced and then remarried my husband um, and my mother and I have a, a very good relationship. So in that way, it's not, it's not from my life, but I think um, the part maybe that is from my life is just um, being in, um, you know, a relationship for a long time and, and, you know, going through the ups and downs and um, especially maybe with mother and daughter, um, you know, I didn't realize this until I had children, um, you know, you think of your, your parents as, as this, these figures, they're, they're parents, they, they should be perfect, they're not actually real people that have, you know, desires and goals and, and flaws, and, and then you have kids and you realize, oh no, they are real people and they don't always have it together and they're not going to say and do the right thing, and so you kind of reshift, it is a refound love in a way, it's, it's, you know, the, the mother-child or father-child relationship of relearning who that person is. I see that happening um, kind of on the flip side with my teenage daughters. I have two teenage daughters and two younger sons. Um, but with the teenage daughters, I see them, you know, becoming their own people. And there's more and more of their life that I don't know about. Um, and so I'm kind of in that, that stage of where I will have to relearn who they are and um, hopefully they will, you know, relearn in a different way who, who I am too. And so it's just this ever evolving, you know, um, relationship. And, and I, I love writing about uh, things like that. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Amy. Thank you for, for that was a, a wonderful answer. Thank you for, yeah, for sharing. Um, a lot of insight with us this evening um, in, in through, your, through your writing. I think, um, I, I think, 
uh, there's something that, that a lot of us can find to identify with there. Um, I'm particularly identifying with that idea of grace and, and how important that is to extend to other people and to ourselves. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> especially now um, and, and to work on. Um, so um, I'm sorry we, we didn't get to every single question. Thank you so much for asking questions. I will mention quickly um, The Good Luck Stone by Heather Bell Adams, who is, is from here in Hendersonville. I don't think she lives here anymore, but she's, born, uh, she's from here. Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Ng and The Leavers by Lisa Cutter. Were you? Uh, recommendations. Um, and um, I would like to, um, we're at 702, so we'll want to wrap up, um, but just leave it to you for any final thoughts before we, before we leave this evening. Yeah. yeah, this has been wonderful, and I absolutely love seeing everyone's faces, and especially the people that, I, that are far away, or that even people that are close, but I just don't get to see. So I'm, I thank you so much for coming, and, and for new faces of, of folks that I, that I, don't know or maybe don't know that well. I'm so glad to, to meet you this way online. Thank you for, for having me. Thank you, Amy. Um, it's been a pleasure seeing you again. Um, it's been a been a while. <laughs> um, and uh, and we're, we're, we congratulate you on the new book. Um, thank and thank you. you for sharing it with us this evening. And thanks again to everyone who has joined us this evening. We know that there are demands on your time and we really appreciate you spending your time with us. And we appreciate your supporting uh, Malaprops um, as best you can. Um, and we hope to see you again at, at another event and eventually back in the store. Um, so meanwhile, please stay safe and well, everyone, and, um, and take good care. Um, and we'll see you soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amy. Good night, everybody.